Good morning. This is the Macro Church of Christ Sunday, Samuel to Chronicle study. We're in 2 Samuel chapter 6 is where we're at. If you're watching this online, there's our website or my email. You can email me if you want to. Uh, we have 1 Samuel that we already covered. We're in 2 Samuel right now. We just want to remind you that 1 Samuel dealt with, with Samuel the prophet, his birth and his, his life, and Saul, who became the first king. God then rejected him and made David king after him. And so we're in the middle of the story with David. After David becomes king of Israel, the whole country. Uh, before then, you remember, he was fleeing. He was in exile. He was running away from Saul because Saul was trying to kill him. And then finally, when Saul died, uh, a little bit later, a couple, a few years later, then David became king over all of Israel. And so in 2 Samuel, what we notice here is the reign of David. The fact that he gets more and more and more and more uh, successful or, or is accepted and becomes uh, one of the greatest kings of Israel. And then we're going to notice his trouble and then we're going to notice the decline of his reign, if you want to say that. And so uh, he reigns over Israel here in beginning at chapter five, as we noticed, and we're, we're going to be over here in chapter six and seven and, and looking there. And David uh, lived in Hebron for uh, for about seven years, uh, seven and a half years in Hebron, and then he lives in Jerusalem. And remember, he just conquered Jerusalem, and so he's going to go and live in it uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, now, going along with that, we have First Chronicles, which of course is deals with the story of David. Uh, a lot of the introductory material from chapter one to chapter 10, chapter ten is genealogies, and and um, uh, counting of of people and lists of people uh, who uh, help tie in this book with the history of God's people. And so we're, we're going to notice some things here, though, as we begin to look at David, because they highlight part of David's life beginning in chapter 11. And we're going to notice some of those things today as we get in here. But I just wanted to show you that also I wanted to remind you that we're under what's called the United Kingdom. <clears throat> and the United Kingdom is this period here when basically the kingdom of God was united with the exception of David and Saul when they had their little problem there. But they only had one king even during this time. Uh, Saul was their king until he died. Then David becomes king over Israel after they all accept him. And then Solomon, his son, is going to become king. And then after that, we're going to have this division where the 10 northern tribes are up here. And this is their kings. And the Two southern tribes are down here, and this is going to rule over them. So we'll look at this chart a little bit more as time progresses and as we take a look at the things that are there. Now, the next thing I want you to notice is that I have two uh, openings of the uh, E sword on here. And the reason for that is because we're going to be looking at Chronicles over here a little bit. We're going to be looking over here at where we're at in 2 Samuel chapter 6 is where we're at today. And so let me remind you of what we covered over here in chapter 5 real quick by just reviewing this for you. Remember that David was anointed king over all of Israel, and that's what you have there. And then as a result of that, he went out and fought against the Philistines. And as he fought against the Philistines, he was victorious. And, and uh, he basically gave them uh, liberty or freedom from, from the Philistines. And so in, at the very end, it says in verse 25 of chapter 5, it says, Then David did so just as the Lord had commanded him, and struck down the Philistines from Geba as far as uh, Gezer. And so David had had success over the Philistines and had fought over them. And then we're going to get into chapter 6. We're in chapter 6, as you notice, it's about the moving of the ark. But before we do that, let's come over here to Chronicles. And let me just point out a couple of things that you, you might want to remember. In Chronicles chapter 10, you had the death of Saul and his son. And uh, I, we, already know, we already noticed that in 1 Samuel. Or, or in, uh, yeah, in 1 Samuel. Uh, but as, as we did that, remember that we're using Samuel as our main text in Chronicles just to kind of help us out. But I wanted to go through this a little bit with you so you could see it. And so here we have the death of, De of Saul and his son. And we have that written for us over in, in 1 Samuel also. And then we have David anointed king. And notice here that it says in, in 1 Chronicles 11.1, 1, Then all Israel gathered to David at Hebron and said, Behold, we are your bone and your flesh. And so... <clears throat> at this time, uh, in chapter 11, we have just the straight jump from the death of Saul to David becoming king over all of Israel. 
And that's why we're using Samuel's account because Samuel's account gives us a little bit more detail as to what's going on. But basically you have here the fact that, that all of them, <clears throat> all of Israel uh, comes over and becomes part of, of uh, under the kingdom. They're unified under the kingdom of David. And then as we already noticed, David comes along and he takes Jerusalem. Uh, he takes Jerusalem and defeats it and that becomes his capital. And then we have this list of mighty men that are listed here that we really didn't see much in 1 Samuel, but we have a, 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 a list of these mighty men. And I'm not gonna go through here and, and read them all for you, but you can. Basically, this is those men that supported David uh, even before he became king over Israel. Uh, and it tells, tells you who was in command and who was over what. And like I said, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go through all of these uh, in order for you to, in order for us to, to just look at the names and and see them, although uh, some of them have a little bit of detail <clears throat> about how, how strong the, the mighty men were. But I just wanted to point that out to you there, that these are the men who, who were with David and who were part of his, his army. I also want you to notice chapter 12. The chapter 12 then deals with David's mighty men, but not just the mighty men that, he, that came over when he was uh, the king, but the mighty men that he, would, that he recruited or that came to him while he was in exile under Saul. And you remember he was under exile under Saul and he was hiding in the stronghold. And so people would find out about him and they would come. And so notice that it says in 1 Chronicles 12, 1, now these are the, son, these are the ones who came to David at Ziglag while he was still restricted because of Saul, the son of Kish, and they were among the mighty men who helped him in war. So it's going to give us now a list of these mighty men who came over to David. Remember, they're the 600 men that we talked about uh, as David would go out and pursue the, the uh, uh, people who had defeated um, Ziglag, his town. And you remember, he, he then took 600 soldiers with him. And these are the men that are under consideration at that time. These aren't the people who came to him. Well, when he became king, these are the people who came to him while he was uh, defected or while he was in exile. Uh, and so notice that as it, it lists these mighty men, it says, and they were among the mighty men who helped him in war. They were equipped with bows using both right hand and left hand to sling stones and to shoot arrows from the, uh, from the bow. Uh, they were Saul's kinsmen from Benjamin. So he goes through and he's gonna list all these different people who came to David and were trained for war. And, and here you have the people that came from, uh, from the Gadites uh, and there came over to David in, in the stronghold in the wilderness, mighty men of valor, men trained for war who could handle shields and spear and whose, face it, whose faces were like the, the faces of lion, lions and they were as swift as the gazelles on the mountain. And so it gives you a little description of the, of the kind of men that came over to fight with David while he was in exile. And so he just lists all these different men and, and he lists what they, what they could do. And notice here that it, it says uh, in verse 14, and these are the sons of Gad who were captains over the army. And uh, he, he who was uh, least was equal to a hundred uh, and the greatest to a thousand. In other words, uh, they were really good warriors. And so you go through here and now you have a list of those people that came over from the different tribes when David was in the stronghold. And so these men would come over, not when David became king, but they would rebel against their, their present ruler who would have been Saul, and they would have come over to David and been with David. And so they're meeting with him. So he just goes through and he lists some of those. Uh, he lists here, for example, in verse 18 of First Chronicles 12, then the spirit came upon uh, Amasa, uh, who was the chief of the 30. And he said, we are yours, O David. And, and with you, O son of Jesse, peace, peace to you, and peace to him who helps you. Indeed, your, your God helps you. Then David received them and made them captains of the, of the band, and made him captain of the band. And so you notice all these people that defected from Manasseh, some people defected and came over to David who were able to, to fight. Uh, and then also notice in verse 20, it says, as he went to Ziglag, there, there defected to him from Manasseh, and then he lists all these people that defected from Manasseh to come over to him while he was in uh, exile. Uh, and then it says in verse 21, and they helped David against the band of raiders 
or they were all mighty men of valor and were captains in the army. The, the raiders here are talking about the, the um, I believe it was the Amalekites who came up and fought against Ziglag. Remember when David went over uh, and was going to go to war against Saul with the Philistines, but then the Philistines rejected him. Uh, and, and when he went back home to his town, Ziklag it had been burned and all of the, the citizens had been taken. Well, that's who he's talking about here when he says they helped him with the raiders. <clears throat> it says in verse 20, for day by day, men came to David to help him until there was a great army like the army of God. And so it, this simply just goes to enlist the different people that came to him. And these, and, and now verse 23 says, now these are the numbers of the divisions equipped for war who came to David at Hebron. So this is when David was in Hebron and becomes king, you might say, of, of um, Judah and Benjamin. He becomes king over them, uh, and they came over to turn the kingdom of Saul to him, according to the word of the Lord. So these were the, these were the armies then, who as uh, Abner was trying to get uh, a unification of Israel and Judah, that these were the armies that came over to fight with David, uh, against uh, Israel so that they could be unified. And so it just goes to when he lists them all. He lists from Judah, from Levi, from, from Benjamin, from Ephraim. So it goes down here. And like I said, I'm not going to go through and read all of these or tell you why each of them was famous. But there were many that were famous because of some of their exploits. <clears throat> uh, and so it says in, in verse 39, uh, uh, they were there with David three days, eating and drinking for their kinsmen had prepared for them. Moreover, those who were near to them, even as far as Issachar and Zebulon and Naphtali brought food on donkeys, camels, mules, and on oxen, great quantities of flour cakes, fig cakes, uh, and bunches of raisins, wine, or uh, oil, oxen, and sheep. And there was joy indeed in Israel. And so as the cities, as the country's getting unified, there's all this celebration that's going on. And so that, that little section is in there, just kind of stuck in there to talk, talk to us about uh, David's men and his army, and so that helps us understand how they were able to defeat the people they were able to defeat. The, the men that came over to David weren't just weren't just farmers and and you know people who were disgruntled with the government. They were actually soldiers and military men, and so that gives us a list of who they were and and how it was that David was able to defeat his enemy. Although we understand that God was the one who did it. Now, let's get back to where we're at. So now in Second Samuel six, David is now king. You remember in chapter five, he had this victory over the Philistines and he had this victory over the Philistines because they found out that he became king. And when he became king, they then came up and fought against him and David fought against them uh, and inquired of the Lord. Remember, this is when the Lord was fighting with da for David uh, uh, because it says that when you hear the marching in the, in the balsam trees, that that's me, God says. And so remember that David defeats the Philistines. So things are rather tranquil and quiet. <clears throat> and now David is thinking about the Lord and he's thinking about God. And he's kind of wondering, you might say, why, why in the world the, the Ark of the Covenant isn't back where it's supposed to be, or at least back in its tabernacle. Remember that the tabernacle was that, that tabernacle that was made by God, designed by God, and the Ark of the Covenant was supposed to be in the Holy of Holies. Remember, it was divided into those two parts. They had one room that was called the Holy Place, and the other room was called the Holy of Holy. And in the Holy Place, the priest could function, but only the high priest could go in once a year into the Holy of Holies. And, and however, there was no there was no Ark there. And so I, I, I'm not sure during that time if they had, if they had the, the, um, uh, not the Passover, but if they had the Day of Atonement, because there was no ark on which they could put the, the blood, uh, that we do know that they were apparently still continuing the rituals in the holy place, because when uh, David needed some bread, there was the holy bread that had just been taken down from the presence of the Lord. Uh, and so even though the ark wasn't there, there was some form of worship going on, even though that ark wasn't there, but it just wasn't the same. God needs to be there. Whenever you have worship without God, it's kind of dull. Uh, matter of fact, it's, it's pretty dull. God needs to be there with you. The spirit of God needs to be there with you. <clears throat> and so uh, David then is going to try to figure out what to do about this. Now that he has a little bit, a little bit of time, you might say, to think about these things because God has given him victory and you might say 
uh, a little bit of peace. Now, in 2 Samuel 6, 1, here's what it says. <clears throat> now, David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people who were with him to Baal Judah, uh, uh, Bala Judah, to bring up from there, from there, the, the ark of God, which is called by the name, the very name of the Lord of hosts who is enthroned above the cherubim. They placed the ark of God on a new cart that they had, that, uh, that they might bring it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, and Uzzah and uh, Ahio, the sons of Abinadad, were leading the new cart. So they brought it with the ark of God from the house of Abinadad, which was on the hill, and Ahio was walking ahead of the ark. Now, I, I want you to notice a, a couple of things here as we take a look at this. And one of the things is that, that David gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. So this, this wasn't a, a private, you know, activity where David goes and, you know, kind of without any pomp or ceremony, just goes and gets the ark and brings it back. There were 30,000 men of Israel, chosen men, and, and no doubt other people came as these 30,000 men uh, were there. And so there'd be other people there, you know, that, that, that need to eat, that need to, to uh, do the normal, you know, things that uh, a crowd of people would do. So there's a lot of supporting people that, that are, are no doubt there. And we'll, we'll notice that in, in just a little bit, that there was also maidens and, and other people that were there. So it was, a, it, it was a national event, you might say, as they're bringing back their God, the ark, uh, that bore his name, uh, and so uh, they're they're coming to do that. Uh, and if you notice over here in First Chronicles thirteen one, it says, "Then David consulted consulted with the captains of thousands and the hundreds, even with every leader." And so over here, you notice that it gives a little more information in First Chronicle thirteen. It said David consulted with them, so he he asked about it, and apparently. You know, they gave him some advice about how to do it. Now, remember, it's been a number of years since the Ark of the Covenant uh, had actually been in Judah, and therefore, it had been a number of years since people had handled the Ark. It had been sitting inside this this individual's um, barn, you might say, um, during that time. Now, verse two says, "And David arose and went with all the people who were with him to Belal Judah to bring up from there the Ark of God, which is called by." the name, the very name of the Lord of hosts, who is enthroned above the cherubim. Now, as God, uh, uh, as David points this out, um, I want you to notice over here in verse 2 of 1 Chronicles 13, it says, David said to all the assembly of Israel, if it, is, if it seems good to you, and if it is from the Lord our God, let us send everywhere to our kinsmen who remain in all the land of Israel, also the priests and the Levites who are with them in their cities with pasture lands, that they may meet with us and let us bring back the ark of our God to us, for we did not seek it in the days of Saul. And so, so basically, David, uh, like I pointed out, you know, it's this national event. It's not, it's not a little bitty event. And they call everybody. And notice that it says they call the priests and the Levites uh, as they came. So there were priests and Levites there. Now, if you remember what the job of the priests and Levites were, they were supposed to take care of the ark. They were the ones who were supposed to move it. They were the ones who were supposed to, to know what to do with it uh, so that God doesn't strike anybody dead. That's, that's their job. Their job is, is to protect people. And that's, that's one of the things that we need to remember uh, about uh, being a preacher or about teaching people the word of God. Uh, your teaching and your work could cause them to be destroyed. If, if, we're te if we're not teaching what God wants us to teach, and rather than teaching people to have faith in God, we teach them to have faith in us or to have faith in some church or to have faith in, in some philosophy or some rules, then uh, we're, we're going to lead people to destruction instead of leading people to life. And the priests were supposed to lead people to life. That was their job. And so the, there were priests there. So I don't want you to think that as David went and did this, that there weren't people there who were supposed to know uh, there were. And so let's see, let's see what happens as they strive to bring back this ark. Now, the other thing I want you to notice here 
is that they're bringing it up from the bringing up from there the ark of god which is called by my name now the idea of being called by my name means that it has god's authority in it but not not just his authority it's talking about the very character of god i'm afraid that sometimes when we read the the word name all we think about is like authority and you know i have the right to do stuff and, and we often use it in the sense of judgment but his name was a name of mercy his name was a name of kindness and goodness and and graciousness and you need to understand that to really understand why uh why the reaction is so strong about what happens here as we read this because that's what a lot of people think about god a lot of people believe and god he is gracious and good and loving and kind and god would never do anything that might hurt somebody you might think or god would never cause problems in people's lives because god is so good and god is so wonderful and, and so we have this this paradigm uh, paradigm of, of god in our minds and, and when all of a sudden something happens that doesn't fit into that paradigm we have rather than rejecting our paradigm we'll, we'll reject god and a lot of people do and they reject god for various reasons for example they'll they'll say well if there's a god how come there's all this wickedness in the world and so there you there you have it if god's so good and kind and gracious then you know why would god allow wickedness and why why if you read the bible does sometimes god cause things to happen that hurt people and so what i want you to remember is that the name of god is not just he has the right to do something certainly that's included in there but it's also speaking about his character the very ark represents the character of God. And, and it wasn't just about God having authority. It was about God forgiving people. It was about God being merciful to people who didn't deserve it, people who broke the law. And so it says the very name of the Lord. And notice that the, the word Lord here is capitalized, uh, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Uh, even in your Bible, if the first letter L is bigger and the other ones are smaller, Look at the smaller letters and notice that they're in capital case. Uh, um, look at the R and the D. And so whenever you see that, that's the same word in, in it should be the same word as Yahweh or Jehovah. Um, and that's his covenant name. And so it's got the covenant name. And, and that's why I want you to understand that it's not just God has the right to do whatever he wants. He certainly does. But it's God's covenant name. In other words, this is a name that God says, you're my friend. I, I'm going to take care of you. Uh, I'm going to help you. And so it's his covenant name. And that's what we need to remember in this story. The very name of the Lord of hosts who is enthroned above the cherubim. Now, enthroned above the cherubim is a representation of the mercy seat. The mercy seat that basically the lid of the Ark of the Covenant had two cherubims on it, one on each side, and their, their uh, wings kind of touched each other and so therefore their faces would be looking down into the box if there was not lid on it and that person who was represented as being on top of that mercy seat was god and if you notice what's when the when the day of atonement came they had to bring the blood of the bull and put it on that they had to pour it on top of that mercy seat on top of that um, cover they had to pour blood on it because it, it, it represented god's forgiveness and the way it was God's forgiveness was God was going to die for us. That blood represents God dying for us so that his angels uh, who protect his glory would not come down in and destroy man because of their sinful activity as they see inside the ark that has the, that, that has the law in it and the rod, the Aaron's rod that budded and the, and the manna in it and man was breaking uh, the law. And so rather than the cherubims flying to destroy us, they see God's mercy, and therefore they're, they're held at bay, you might say. But I want you to understand that that's what you have on that ark. And so it's mentioned here. And so you have all this mercy and graciousness that's going on. And so that's why this is such a striking event that we're going to notice here. But we're also going to notice something else about the importance of it as we do. And so it says in verse, in verse 3, And they placed the ark of God in a new cart that they might bring it from the house of Abinadad, uh, which was on the hill, and Uzzah and uh, Ahio, the sons of Abinadad, were leading the new cart. And so here, here you have uh, uh, Abinadad. And uh, Abinadad, uh, if, if you remember, was, was the, the one in whose house um, 
the the ark had been and had been had they had been blessed okay and it says that they placed the, the they placed the ark of god on a new cart that they might bring it up, up that they might bring it from the house of abinadad now why would they place it on a new cart well of course because it's god god deserves new things and so therefore they're they're bringing it up in a new cart so they're not giving god junk they're 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 giving god a new cart because you know they they want to bring up the cart they want to bring up the the ark of the covenant you can't have god riding in a an old beat up car you have to have something something nice so they they made this new cart for him i'm sure that i'm sure they made it special for him that they might bring up the the, the ark out from the house of abinadad and and when they did that it says by the way which was on a hill so no doubt there's a little slant or slopes and various things uh, and Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadad, were leading the new cart. And so you, you have the, the sons of, uh, of Abinadad. And no doubt they had become pretty familiar, you might say, with the idea of having the ark around. And what happens is a lot of times that when we become familiar, uh, we then become too, uh, things become too common for us. And we forget the importance of them. That's what happens with people in their marriage. You know, when husbands first marry their wives, they're very attentive to them. But then after they're married and after they've been living together for a while, uh, the husband isn't very attentive to his wife. And the reason is because, you know, it, uh, um, there's, there's a saying, I can't remember exactly how it goes, but um, familiarity breeds contempt, I believe is the way that goes. And basically what that means is the more that you're accustomed to somebody, the more you spend time around them, the less respectful you get of them. And that's what happens here with apparently the sons of Abinadab. They'd seen the Ark of the Covenant, had been in their place for a long time. They'd gotten quite familiar with it. Um, now, I don't know if they'd ever touched it, and I'm not saying they did. I'm just simply saying that it was something that they were used to seeing. Uh, it was something that they were used to, to being around. Whereas if you remember when it's in the, when it's in the uh, Holy of Holies, nobody's supposed to see it. And that even the priest can see it, except for the high priest once a year. Uh, it's, it's kind of like uh, if you took a book that was, you know, the first edition, and you took that book and you put it inside a case, and people come over to look at it, and, and, you, and they say to you, can I see the book? they would treat it a whole lot more respectfully than just some book that's sitting on your coffee table that they can just reach out and grab whenever they want. So there would be this sense with these two boys of Uzzah and Ohio to be more familiar with, with the art because after all, they are, uh, they're the ones in whose house it's been in for a while now. And so they're, they're leading the new cart. So uh, uh, it says, in verse four, so they brought it with the ark of God from the house of Abinadad, which was on the hill. And uh, uh, Ohio was walking ahead of the ark. So one guy's in front of the ark and probably the other guy's behind it or whatever, uh, you know, just kind of trying to be respectful. Now, while, while this was going on, while, while this was happening and the ark is moving, the, the people aren't just sitting there going, you know, aren't just sitting on the side watching. Uh, let's let's notice what they're doing, okay? And it says uh, in verse in oh uh, by the way the other thing I was going to mention was when when they they put it on this new cart when it came from from the Philistines they had it on a cart if you remember so they had it on a cart and they took it down from the cart apparently somehow and they set it uh, inside a Benadad's house or barn or wherever it was and they set it down. And so it was, you know, kind of like that's the way it came. So, so, excuse me. <coughs> excuse me. So that's where that's where they're going to move it because that, you know, that's the way it came to them. Uh, a, a number of years after it had been gone, uh, and and a number of years after anybody had moved it or it had walked anywhere or gone anywhere, and, and so there there wasn't much transporting of the ark from place to place anymore uh, because the the children of Israel weren't wandering around. So it had been sitting basically in a tent and wasn't moved very often. And so therefore, 
when you don't do something very often, you get complacent about how to do it. So let's see what happens. Now, as we, as we just read that, uh, notice down here what it says in 1 Chronicles 13, 5. It says, so David assembled all Israel together from uh, Shihor of Egypt, even to the, to the uh, entrance of Hamath, to bring the Ark of God from Kir Kiriath uh, Jerem. So you can see that it was really, really uh, an event that was going on here. And it says, and David and all Israel went up to uh, Bala, that is to Kiriath uh, Jerem, which belonged to Judah, to bring up the the uh, to bring up from there the Ark of God, the Lord who is enthroned above the cherubim, where His name is called. And they carried the Ark of God on a new cart from the house of Abinadad, and Uzzah and uh, Ahio drove the cart. So they were, they were the ones leading the cart. They were the ones in front. They were the ones doing this uh, that was going on there. And it says, now, verse 8, David and all Israel were celebrating before God with all their might, even with songs and with lyres and harps and tambourines and cymbals and trumpets. And so you understand that what's happening is there's this big celebration. There's this national celebration as the ark is coming. Verse 5 of first, Second Samuel 6 says, Meanwhile, David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with all kinds of instruments made of fir wood and with lyres and harps and tambourines and canastas, uh, uh, castanets and cymbals. And so there's this big celebration that happened because here comes God back into the tabernacle where it's supposed to come. Now, we don't know how, how far they moved it, but I don't think they moved it very far. But as they, it was moving, all the people are dancing, the people are celebrating there. You know, it's, it would be like great fanfare. Uh, it, it, would, it would be kind of like, uh, you know, the president coming into, into your city. And so you, you pull out the, the, the stops and you get the band and you get the, the, the police escort and you get all that. And, 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 you know, and as the police are driving, all of a sudden, one of the police cars blows up. Because notice what happens here. It says, but when they came to the threshing floor of Nacor, Uzzah reached out towards the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen nearly upset it. And the anger of the Lord burned against Uzzah, and God struck him down there for his irreverence, and he died there by the ark of God. Wow. So there you go. They're bringing in the ark of the covenant. They got it on a new cart. They're, they think they're being respectful. They think they're, they're doing what they're supposed to do. Uh, and all of a sudden, Uzzah, who cares about the ark, he cares about the ark to the extent where when he sees it starting to fall, he doesn't want it to fall. He, he doesn't want the ark to get hurt. I mean, you know, what could be more, more concer uh, con uh, concerning than that? Or, or, you know, how in the world would that, would that, uh, um, be anything that was wicked or anything like that. Uh, but it says, and so therefore when he saw the arcs, uh, when he saw the, the ox stumbling and the, and the ark maybe starting to fall, he reached out his hand to study the ark and died. He says, they came to the threshing floor of Nacor, Uzzah, reached out towards the ark of God and took hold of it for the ox nearly uh, upset it and the anger of the Lord burned against us, and God struck him down there for his irreverence, and he died there by the ark of God. Now, I want you to notice over here, it, it says that here they are in 1 Chronicles 13, and they are, you know, they're dancing, they have the trumpets, they have the fanfare going, and it says, when they came to the threshing floor of uh, uh, Shaddon, Uzzah put out his hand to take hold of the ark, because the oxen nearly upset it, and the anger of the Lord burned against Uzzah, so he struck him down because he put his hand out, uh, because he put out his hand to the ark, and he died there before the Lord. Wow. Why would God do that? I mean, here these people are trying to bring God back home, and God kills this person because he's trying to protect the ark. Well... Let's see what happens. Verse, verse 6 says, or sorry, verse 8 of 2 Samuel 6 says, And David became very angry because of the Lord's outburst against Uzzah. And that place is called Perez Uzzah 
to this day. In other words, outbreak of the Lord. So David was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said, how can the ark of the, of the Lord come to me? And David was unwilling to, mo to move the ark of God into the city of David with him. But David took it, took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the, the Gittite. And thus the ark of God remained in the house of o Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom, uh, blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. Now, now, it was told King David, saying, the Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him on account of the ark of God. And David went up and brought up the ark of God from, from, went up, sorry, David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. All right, so you notice something had to happen there. So let's take a look and, and notice what's going on here. Now, verse 8. It says, David became angry because the Lord's outburst against Uzzah, and that place was called Perez Uzzah to this day. In other words, the outbreak of the Lord. If you, if you look over here in Chronicles, uh, as they were celebrating and the, the oxen nearly moved, it says in verse 10, the anger of the Lord burned against Uzzah, so he struck him down because he put out his hand to the ark, and he died there before God. And then David became angry because of the Lord's outburst at Uzzah, and he called that place Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of God that day, saying, how can I bring the ark of God home to me? So David did not take the ark with him to the city of David, but took it aside to the house of, uh, 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 of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And thus the ark remained with the family of Obed-Edom there three months. And the Lord blessed the family of Obed-Edom with, uh, with all that he had. Now, a couple of things to notice here. Notice, first of all, that David became angry. God gets angry with God. Really? Seriously? God's angry with God? Well, sure. Why? Well, because David is trying to do a good thing. He's trying to bring God back home, and he's bringing this, you know, and he brings all the people to witness this marvelous event of bringing God home, bringing God back into, into his, his house, into his tent, so that the children of Israel can worship and truly have a connection with God. And he's going to bring them back. And he's got all the people here and they're singing, they're dancing, they're rejoicing. And then God ruins it. And God makes David look bad. And so David becomes angry. You know what this reminds me of? It reminds me of Saul. I'm sorry. It reminds me of Cain and Abel. When Abel offered an acceptable sacrifice to God, and Cain didn't, and Cain was mad. Cain was mad because God accepted Abel's sacrifice, but didn't accept his sacrifice. Now, the difference between David and Cain is what they did as a result of it. See, God gets angry with us when we deserve it. God's our father, and just like your father will get angry with you when you do something you're not supposed to do, God gets angry with his children when they do something they're not supposed to do, especially something that's disrespectful, especially something that's, that's not right. Um, and so uh, that, that's, what's, that's what's under consideration here. Uh, and, and so uh, David becomes angry. Now, that's his first reaction. That'd probably be our first reaction. We'd be angry, we'd be, we'd be upset because of the outburst of the Lord. When, when we first react to what's happening, you know, he, here he, he kills a man who David probably put in charge of trying to take care of the ark and make sure it was safe and, and bring it back. And so the, the man dies. Now, uh, what we need to remember is that God had given them directions on how to move the ark. Uh, and so in verse 9 of, of 2 Samuel 6, it says, so David was afraid of the Lord that day, and he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? In other words, how can we move the ark of God? You see, that's the question he should have asked before he ever moved it. He should have asked that question. Has God directed us on how to move the ark or not? Has God said there is a certain way to move the ark? Or can I just move it any way, any way I want to? Uh, if, you, if you notice in Numbers 17, 12, it says, Then the sons of Israel spoke to Moses, saying, Behold, we perish, we are dying, we are all dying. Everyone who comes near, who comes near to the tabernacle of the Lord, must die. Are, are we to perish completely? In other words, they're saying that because 
when when God first set up the tabernacle and and uh, uh, God was placed in it, they had this deep reverence for God, and they were afraid that if they got close to Him, that they would be killed. And so they're they're coming and asking Moses, "How in the world will we be able to deal with God if we can't get close to Him?" And so so um, the God gives him directions on, on how to do that. And God gave him directions on how to move the ark. And so David finally asked the right question. How can the ark of the Lord come to me? And that's what we need to ask about everything. If you're raising children, how does God want you to raise those children? If you're an employer, how does God want me to treat my employees? Uh, if, if you're an employer, if you're an employee, how does God want me to treat my boss? Uh, if, you're, if you have an enemy, how does God want me to treat my enemy? We should always constantly be asking God, asking God, how do you want me to do these things? Uh, what is it you want me to do? Instead of us just looking at how the world does things and going, well, that's good enough for me. The world does that, so we're going to do that. That's what we're going to do because the world does it. Well, that's not what we do. We don't do what the world does. We do what God tells us to do because we're his people. And so, therefore, we constantly have to be asking, what is it that God wants me to do? How is it that God wants me to act? Uh, what am I supposed to do? because God is the one that we need to respect. And notice that it says, so, so David was afraid of the Lord that day. Now, I think this idea of fear here, that's under consideration is not terror, but all of a sudden David had a little different attitude with God. Because as I pointed out before, sometimes we get complacent uh, with commonness. And so as David has been dealing with God and God has been gracious to David and, and, and God seems to be behind everything David does, and all of a sudden, David does something and it doesn't work out right, and, and it's God who makes him look bad. It's God who, who is chastising him. And then all of a sudden, David has a different respect. He has a different attitude uh, towards God. And that's when he asks, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? Uh, that's what he wants to do. And that's what he asks over here in Second Chron in First Chronicles 13. That's recorded for us. David was afraid of God that day, saying, how can I bring the ark of God home to me? And so what does David do? Well, it says in verse 10 uh, of 2 Samuel 6, and David was unwilling to move the ark of, of the Lord into the city and uh, of David with him. But David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. Now, I'll tell you exactly what people are thinking. Ooh, too bad for Obed-Edom. He's got the ark of God in there and that God's going to kill him. God's going to, you know, God's going to be so strict with him and and that he's probably going to destroy his house and, and everything kind of like he did to the Philistines when the Philistines took the ark and they were cursed. Well, that's probably what they're thinking, especially now since they moved the ark and, and uh, Uzzah dies because he reached out to touch the ark. What in the world, what in the world is, is going to happen here with uh, uh, Obed-Edom? What, what, you know, it, it's probably going to be terrible. Uh, and so in verse 11, it says, thus the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the, the Gittite, three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. Well, rather than Obed-Edom being cursed because he had the Ark of Co the Covenant in there, he was blessed. Well, wait a minute. God kills Uzzah, but he blesses Obed-Edom. And so you kind of have to wonder, well, what's going on here? Well, just because God chastised his people and punished his people doesn't mean that God's character changed. God's character is still the same. God's character is that he loves us. He cares about us. He, want, he, he wants us to, to love him. He wants us to love people. And so there was something about what was going on that caused God's anger, caused God's righteous anger, but it doesn't change God's character. God's character is still a character of love and grace and mercy. Uh, and so as Obed-Edom is is taking care of the ark, whatever that means, probably keeping things away from it and probably making sure that it's safe and, and protecting it. Uh, God uh, blessed him because that's what God does. God blesses people. God takes care of us. God blessed the whole, God blessed the whole world when he, when he put man uh, on the world for, uh, for him and he, he created the whole world for man. So he blessed man. God wants to bless people. God doesn't want to destroy people, but yet uh, we as people need to learn. We, we need to understand things because we're made in the image of God. And being made in the image of God, we choose right and wrong. And choosing right and wrong sometimes requires us to receive consequences 
that aren't very pleasant so that we learn to make proper choices. And sometimes that even requires uh, some of us to die so that the rest of the people can learn, can learn the lesson that God wants to teach us. And so that's what we have going on here. But what I want you to notice is rather than the Ark of the Covenant uh, destroying uh, Obed-Edom or Obed-Edom having to be so cautious about it that, you know, he, he uh, is afraid of it, it says that God blessed him. And so what, what happens there? Now, it's, it's been there for three months. Now, it says, now it was told, David, saying, the Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him on account of the ark of God. And David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of, the, of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. All right, I'm confused. He left it at Obed-Edom because he was afraid to move it. But now he, he can move it. Now, now he says it's okay to move just simply because Obed-Edom was, was, was blessed. Is that what's going on here? No. There, there's some other stuff going on here that we, we need to look at here. But let's look at Chronicles 13 and verse 13. It says, so David did not take the ark with him to the city of David, but took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. Thus the, the ark of God remained with the family of Obed-Edom in his house three months, and the Lord blessed the family of Obed-Edom with all that he, that he had. Now, I want you to notice that in Chronicles, in chapter 14, where you would expect to find the answer for this, uh, you really don't. What you find is the story about David, that, and we've already looked at the children of David, but here's another list of the children of David and, and his wives and the people that, he, that you know, his, his family. Uh, and then you have the story about him defeating the Philistines, which we already covered back over there in, uh, before the moving of the ark. So, so this gets thrown in here uh, in this story uh, in Chronicles. Uh, because it's dealing with more of the, of the, uh, how, how can I put this, more of the important events in the life of David rather than chronologically going through the story. Uh, and so you, so you have this, this story here then that's put in here when it was put in at different places in Samuel. And so verse 17 of First Chronicles 14 says, by the way, we already covered this in Samuel. It says, then the fame of David went out into, the, into all the land and the Lord brought the fear of him on all the nations. And so as a, a result of David's victory over the Philistines, then David had that, uh, had <clears throat> a sense of peace and the nations were afraid to come fight against him. And that's why he was, you know, wanting to move the ark before. And so <clears throat> we still don't have the answer to why then does it say that he moved the ark if he had been afraid to move the ark before? Well, <clears throat> here's the reason why. In 1 Chronicles 15, 1, here we have more information on David's decision to move the ark. It says, now David built houses for himself in the city of David, and he prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched a tent for it. Then David said, no one is to carry the ark of God, but the Levites, for the Lord chose them to carry the ark of God to, uh, and to minister to it. So uh, let me do this here for just a sake so I can... Uh, show you some other things here. I uh, want to point out a couple of things here for you. Let me do this here. Uh, if you if you come over here to uh, uh, in uh, in number seven, you have a, a whole chapter that deals with the function and the work of the Levites and. The dividing up of the work. Some of them were in charge of, of taking down the tabernacle. Some were in charge of taking care of the ark. Some were in, in charge of, of loading it up. Some were in charge of different things. Now, in Numbers 7 and verse 9, it says, but he did not give any to the sons of Kohath, because there, theirs were the service of the holy objects, which they carried on their shoulders. So, in order to, to move the ark of the covenant, uh, the Kohathites had to do it, and they had to move it by carrying it on their shoulders. That's why the Ark of the Covenant had the four rings on the side of it with poles that would stick through it, because it was supposed to be carried by the children of Israel. That's who was supposed to carry it. Uh, in in uh, Numbers 4 and verse 19, 
it says, but uh, do this to them that they may live and not die when they approach the most holy object. Aaron and his sons shall go in and assign each of them to his work and to his load, but they shall not go in to, to see the holy object even for a moment or they, or they will die. So Aaron and his sons were supposed to cover the ark even before the sons of Kohath were to carry the ark. They were supposed to cover it up so nobody would even see it. Uh, you know, the only thing they would see is the pole sticking out, you might say, and they weren't allowed to see it. Uh, and that's why in, in um, Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know, when they take the, the lid off and people look into it, they die. And not only that, but when it came back to Israel, uh, a number of those people that, that um, were in Kiriath Jeber, I believe, where the ark had been fir had, was first kept, many of them died because they looked into the ark. Uh, and so there was, a, there was a lot of irreverence going on with the ark. But the reason why David could now move the ark is because David says, I figured out that God wants us to move the ark and, and only the Levites are supposed to carry the ark. That's what they're supposed to do. Uh, and so it says in verse three, and David assembled all Israel at Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the Lord to its place, which he had prepared for it. And David gathered together the sons of Aaron and the Levites uh, of the sons of Kohath, uh, Ariel, the chief, and 120 of his relatives of the sons of uh, uh, Merari, uh, Asai, the chief, and 220 of his relatives of the sons of Gershon. By the way, these are the sons of, of Levi, and uh, they each had their role in, in moving the ark and moving the tabernacle. And the sons of Gershom, Joel, and the, and the chief, and 130 of his relatives, and the sons of, of um, where am I here? And the sons of uh, Eliphaz, uh, Elizaphan, uh, uh, Shemaiah, the chief, and 200, 200 of his relatives, and the sons of uh, Hebron, uh, Eli, and the chief, and 80 of his relatives, and of the sons of Azil, Aminadab, uh, the, the chief, and 120 of his relatives. And David called for Zadok and Abiathar the priests, and for the Levites, for uh, Uriel and Asiah, Joel and uh, Shemaiah, uh, Eliah and Abinadad, and said to them, you are the heads of the father's household of the Levites. Consecrate yourselves, both you and your relatives, that you may bring up the ark of the Lord God to Israel, to the place that I have, that I have prepared for it, because you did not carry, the, uh, carry it at the first, the Lord our God made an outburst on us, for we did not seek his, him according to the ordinance. So the priests and the Levites consecrated themselves to bring up the, the ark of the Lord of Israel. And the sons of the Levites carried the ark of God on their shoulders with the poles there, uh, thereon, as Moses commanded them according to the word of the Lord. And David uh, then... Uh, Lost my place here. Uh, then David spoke to the chiefs of the Levites to appoint their relatives, their singers, and the instruments of music, harp, harps, lyres, loud sounding cymbals to raise sounds of joy. So the Levites appointed Herman, the son of Joel, uh, and from his relatives, uh, Asaph, the son of uh, Berechiah, and from his sons, Merari, their relatives, and Ethan, the son of uh, Cushite, and, and, with the, and with them, their relatives, of the second rank, uh, Zechariah, Ben, uh, ben uh, Zeriel, uh, Sher uh, Maoth, uh, Jael, uh, Uni, uh, Eliab, uh, Benaiah, Messiah, uh, Mathathiah, uh, Eliphalil, uh, uh, Mechnia, uh, Obed Edom, and uh, Jeriel, the gatekeepers. So the singers, uh, Herman, uh, Asaph and uh, Athan were pointed to the to to sound aloud symbols of bronze. Now, uh, Asaph, you'll read about in the Psalms, and he's one of the musicians, and so he writes songs, and that's why you read about him. Uh, and then he goes through, and I'm not going to read the, the the rest of these names, but these are basically the singers and the people who who were to move the ark and the gatekeepers. So you have the gatekeepers and you have the priests. And notice that it says the priest blew the trumpets before the ark of God and Obed-Edom, the uh, Jehite, also was, were the gatekeepers of the ark. Now verse 25. So it was David with the elders of Israel and the captains over thousands 
who went to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from the house of Obed-Edom with joy because God was helping the Levites who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. They sacrificed seven bulls and seven rams. Now David would close uh, with a robe of fine linen. So I just want to stop there. So all of that, all that that we just read should go right in here as we're reading about uh, David in, in 2 Samuel 6 and, and David being told that Obed-Edom's house is being blessed. Uh, it, it says uh, in verse 12, now it was told David, it was told King David saying, the Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belong to him on account of the ark of God. And David went up and brought up the ark of God. Now in between that little statement there, um, that's where you have all of this stuff that's mentioned in 1 Chronicles 15. That's why David could now go do this. David said, oh, I figured it out. In the law, it says that God says that we're supposed to move the, we're supposed to move the ark by the priest. Now, there, there's a couple of interesting things that I really think are interesting in this. And that is, number one, God didn't talk to them. God didn't, didn't come to David in, in a vision and say, hey, David, I know you're going to move the ark, but here's where you're supposed to move it. God didn't do that. God didn't, didn't come to David and say, hey, hey, David, let me send somebody to you who can tell you how to move the ark. That's not what God did. God didn't say, David, I, you're moving the ark the wrong way, so let me put into your, into your mind how you're supposed to do it. Now, you might say, well, why are you saying that? Well, because I want you to understand that God expected David to know because it was written. It was written down. God wrote it. Too many people today, because of, of false teachers or, and, and false prophets, you know, who, who, who think that God is, is running around doing miracles and talking to each and every individual person and, and giving each, each individual person instructions and telling them exactly what to do in their life. Because of that kind of teaching, many people don't understand that God primarily talks to us through his word. God puts those principles in his word that he expects us to know, and he expects us to know them. And he's not going to somehow miraculously put, that, put those words in our mind when we already read them and we know what we're supposed to do and we fail to do it. God expects us to do what, he, what he's told us, and God expects us to, to be so concerned with it or so appreciative of it that we remind ourselves of it all the time. You see, there were Levites here when they were moving the ark. You remember? There were Levites there. Why didn't they know? Why didn't they, why didn't they say? Why didn't they come to David and go, David, you know, we've been reading in the law and you're moving this the wrong way. Why didn't they speak up? Why didn't they say something? I'd suggest to you it's because they hadn't moved the ark in such a long time. Nobody was reading it. Nobody cared. Nobody thought. And not only that, but they saw the ark coming in, in, the, in a cart. And so, hey, it works for the Philistines. It'll work for us. And one of the other things that that tells us is that God treats people different according to the knowledge they have of God's words. The, God didn't kill all the Philistines who touched the ark or had to move it in order to get it on the cart or whatever they had to do in order to do that. God didn't kill them. He did punish them. He, he, brought, he brought tumors on them, but he didn't kill them. Uh, and that's because they didn't know. That's because they, they, they didn't have you know, they didn't have a relationship with God to the, to the point where, where they knew how to treat him. But yet God was st still demanded respect from them. And he still re uh, demanded that they understand that he's not like the other gods. But when it came to Israel, who knew the word of God, when it came to Israel, who read the word of God, and by the way, David was supposed to read the word of God every day. By the way, so are you. You're supposed to read the word of God or listen to the word of God every day to remind you of how God wants us to be. Because if you're waiting for God to whisper something in your ear, probably not going to happen. Because God's already told you in, in the word of God. If, if, you're, if, you're, if you're waiting for God to tell you whether you should divorce your wife and, and, you know, and marry this other one because she's nice to you and all you do with your wife is argue, God already talked to you about it. If, if you're a boss and you want to you wanna treat your employees badly and not pay them, not pay them a, a, a living wage, and so you're asking God if you can do that. God's already told you what to do. God says, be gracious and be merciful to them. See, God has already talked to us about the majority of things that you're going to do in your life. God has already talked to you about it. And so if you're with one of these religions that, 
that says, you know, you got to talk to God every day and God's going to tell you what to do, then you fail to understand God. We live by faith. And faith means that we trust what he says. We trust his word. And just like happened with David, when we don't trust his word, when we do something we shouldn't do, then we're going to get into trouble and we're going to find ourselves in difficult situations. Like, for example, when you get credit cards and you charge up your credit cards because we're actually greedy and we just want more stuff, then all of a sudden we find ourselves in a situation where we're a slave to the credit card because you know we've, we've charged up so much stuff that we thought we had to have. And all of a sudden we're a slave and we want God to fix it for us. And so what do we do? Well, some of us declare bankruptcy. And so we basically cheat the people that we owe money to and we act like it's okay and God's pleased with it. God's not pleased with it. But see, that's what happens when we forget God. And that's what God's reminding David of. God wrote the word of God so we could learn about him and so we could live in a way that's going to result in a blessing for us and a blessing for God. Because if you listen to God, if you do what he said, you're going to be like the house of Obed-Edom. God will bless you because God is the giver of blessings. He's the one who blesses us. So why could David move the ark? Because he figured out he had to get the priest to do it. He figured out he had to get certain, certain priests to do it. He had to be moved in a certain way. The high priest had to do certain things to it before it could be moved. Uh, it wasn't supposed to be moved on an ark. It was supposed to be carried personally by the priests, by the Levites. And I'd suggest to you that the reason that God does that is because that's the way kings were carried during that time. Kings were carried by their subjects on, you know, I, I, I forget what it's called, but, you know, basically it's, it's just like the Ark of the Covenant, except it has a place for the person to sit inside of it, and the, the uh, citizens would pick it up, and, and they would consider them privileged. They would consider themselves, you know, honored to be able to be the ones who would carry the king, you know, in, in that little Carter in that little cabana or, or whatever that is. And, and they would be honored to do that because he was, their, he was their king. Well, when it comes to God, he's our God. And so if God wants to be carried by his people, then he's going to be carried by his people. And not only that, I want you to understand that it wasn't just us that touched the ark. It was they did a ton of stuff wrong. They did a bunch of stuff wrong. I'm I was surprised God didn't destroy them before that, or at least didn't destroy somebody before that. I mean, look at everything they did. They had to move the ark and put it on a, on a cart. They had to strap it down or, or do something to it in order to get, and I don't know how it got on, on that cart. Somebody had to put it on that cart. Somebody had to move it. Uh, and somebody had to build the, the, the cart. But Mike, it was a new cart. It doesn't matter if we think we're doing something right, if it's wrong. And it doesn't matter if we think we're doing something for God, if it's not what God told us to do. That reminds me of Saul. When Saul went to war against the Amalekites and God told him, I want you to destroy all the Amalekites. And he comes back and Samuel says, did you do what I told you? And, and Saul goes, yeah, I did. And, De and Samuel goes, then how come I hear oxen lowing and sheep bleeding? And, and why is Agag here? Remember what Saul said? Oh, we're going to do something religious with that. We're going to do something that God likes with it. We're, we're going to offer him sacrifices. So we saved the best one. And we brought uh, uh, Agag over here, you know, as I guess a present for God or something. You remember what Samuel told him, right? He says, that's rebellion. That's rebellion. God told you what to do and you didn't do it. That's what we need to remember. A lot of religions are in rebellion because God has told them to do stuff. And they're not doing it. They're not doing what God says. They've turned faith in God into a religion where people are supporting a religion and where people are supporting a structure or, or a building or property instead of the word of God. 
And so we need to remember that. But I also hope that you see that the graciousness and the mercy of God, that he did that the only person he killed was Uzzah. Because God is gracious. Now let's see what happens as he's, as he's bringing him out with gladness. Now notice it's with gladness. Because if you do what God says, it's, you're going to be happy about it. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. You know, it's happiness. Now 2 Samuel 6, 13, let's finish this section. And so it was that when the bears of the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed an ox and a fatling. So they go six paces, nobody dies. So he offered God a sacrifice. I don't believe he offered God a sacrifice every six paces. Uh, I, I heard one guy uh, commentary say that it was every six paces. Well, I don't think, it doesn't say it's every six paces, but he certainly offered God one after six paces because you know that would be far enough uh, along to know that they weren't going to be killed and that the Levites who were holding the priests were, you know, were going to be safe. Now, another thing I should have mentioned is, how would you like to be the Levite who first goes and touches that ark after Uzzah dies? What is it that would give you confidence that you could touch that ark had be, uh, after Uzzah dies? And the answer is because God said you could. And so now that they're doing what God said they could, everybody's happy because they know they're doing it right. They know nothing's going to happen. And they're, they're being respectful of God. And God is, again, being respected for who he is and not just some object that's being moved by a cart, but he's God of the people and they're supposed to carry him. And so it, and so it, it says, and so it was that when the bears of the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed an ox and a fatling. In other words, he, he sacrificed to God a peace offering because David knew that he was in a right relationship with God and everything was being done properly. And so he offers to God a sacrifice. Now, verse 14, it says, and David was dancing before the Lord with all his might. Uh, some versions say leaping and jumping. Uh, and David was wearing a, a linen ephod. In other words, he, he wasn't wearing his royal apparel. He was just wearing what you, you and I might call his everyday clothes, you might say. And it says, so David and all the house of Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouting and sounds of the trumpet. And so there you go. They can finally bring in the Ark of the Covenant, and they're, they're, they're happy about it. And David's dancing. David's, you know, he's joying. He's, you know, he's raising his hands. He's spinning around. He, he, he just loves God. And, and he loves the fact that God is going to be brought home. And so, you know, he's expressing that. Sometimes I believe that our worship services are a little too serious. And don't misunderstand me. God def definitely deserves to be to have reverence and fear. And the way you reverence and fear him is by doing what he says. But David was dancing and David was, was spinning and having a good time in, in front of God. And God didn't say, that's disrespectful, David. No, that was an expression of David's joy and David's, David's love for God. And so sometimes people get, get upset because people clap in church. That's an expression of joy. It's an expression of being filled with the spirit. And, and, you know, I'm not talking about, you know, making, clapping into, into some kind of musical instrument. That's, you know, that's not what I'm, what, what I'm referring to. Um, but what, what I'm referring to is just the expression of joy. The expression of being able to raise our hands if you want to, or being, or being able to, to just praise God or, or uh, just being able to sing. And somebody said, well, God wants to sing them. Yes. And God wanted them to do this here. But there was also an expression of their bodies that as they were doing those things. It, 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 wasn't, it wasn't done, uh, um, you know, it wasn't sanitized. It was an expression of their hearts. And when you express your hearts properly, your body acts. And are we supposed to be disruptive in service? Of course not. But it is to be joyous. And so just wanted to, Point that out to us. Well, I pray God blesses you for having been here. And we'll, doesn't look like we covered much, but we actually covered, you know, three chapters in, in the book of Chronicles. And we'll be starting in 2 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 16 next week. Pray God blesses you and that uh, he rewards you for, for your faithfulness to him. If there's anything I can do for you, text me or get a hold of me and I'll be happy to help you in any way that I can. God bless.